Good evening, all, and welcome to Faith, Music, and the Double Pandemic. My name is Edward Dixon, and I serve as Executive Director of the Center for Christianity and Scholarship. We bring this event to you in partnership with Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts, Duke Crew, RUF, InterVarsity, Graduate and Faculty Ministries, and Something Borrowed, Something Blue, a Christian a cappella group at Duke. We're thankful for this partnership of academic centers, campus ministries, and musical groups who wanted to join together to share with our communities how music from the lens of faith can inform us as humans in the midst of our dual plight of racial disunity and COVID-19. During tonight's event, we will have the privilege of hearing a conversation between two esteemed musicians and teachers of music. Gordon Conwell, Theological Seminary Professor of Worship, Culture, and Church, Emmett Price, and Duke's Vice, Vice Provost of the Arts, John Brown. Guys, come on out. It's good to see you guys. Emmett, John, it's good to see you. Great to be here. You. Emmett Price is one of the nation's leading experts on music of the African diaspora, Christian worship, and the Black Christian experience. Currently, he serves as professor of worship, church, and culture, and founding executive director of the Institute for the Study of Black Christian Experience at Gordon-Conwell. He has served as visiting professor at Boston University School of Music, Berkeley College of Music, Andover Newton Theological School, and Brandeis University. He is a former research fellow of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard University and Northeastern's Center for the Study of Sport and Society, where he served as the lead scholar on the Rhythm and Flow Initiative, a research project studying the various intersections of music and sport. Dr. Price is founding pastor of Community of Love Christian Fellowship in the Austin neighborhood of Boston, and he is a weekly contributor on WGBH's Boston Public Radio Show. He is also an executive producer and co-host of the All Revved Up podcast. Welcome, Emmett. Good to see you. Thank you. John Brown is bassist, composer, producer, actor, and educator. He currently serves as Duke's first full-time vice provost for the arts, where he is also the director of the jazz program and professor of the practice of music. He has also been a faculty member at UNC Chapel Hill, North Carolina Central University, North Carolina State University, and Guilford College. So John, you've covered all the triangle for us, no matter who on this call has different school allegiances. That's right. <laughs> John has performed for President and Mrs. Barack Obama and at major venues and festivals in the United States and abroad. He boasts a Grammy nomination for his performance and co-writing on Nita Freeland's 1995 release, Shaking Free. He's equally gifted in classical music. He has performed as a substitute with the North Carolina Symphony since 1992 and performs with the Opera Company of North Carolina and the Carolina Ballet. Thank you, gentlemen. And I'm looking forward to the conversation that we have ahead. Before I turn it over to you, I'll just say that after a time of moderated conversation, we'll have an opportunity for audience Q&A. To write a question, please enter it on the Google form at the link now shown in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be sharing your questions with Vice Provost Brown and Dr. Price. We apologize in advance for not being able to get to all the questions, but we still encourage you to ask questions of our presenters. And now without further ado, uh, please join me where you are and we'll know that you are clapping even though we can't hear it. Uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Emmett Price and Vice Provost John Brown. I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Brother Dixon. It's a, a real pleasure to be here uh, and it's a real pleasure to have this space uh, to get to know uh, yet another brother. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity. I'm honored to have this opportunity and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, learning right along with everybody else on the call uh, and hearing the wisdom uh, that uh, we're about to get from this good Dr. Price. Um, I'll say that I, I like to keep things conversational and, uh, uh, and for our audience members, um, we, I'm going to weave in some of our conversation with the questions that have already been submitted. So um, we, we will just kind of let the conversation flow that way and just see 
uh, what direction it'll go. I, I grew up as an old country boy, so uh, I just say, let the Lord lead us and, and we'll follow. Amen. <laughs> uh, so uh, welcome indeed. It's, it's really a, a pleasure to get to have this space. Uh, music, faith, and the double pandemic. Um, there's a lot in that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in that. When you hear that, uh, just as, a, as kind of a beginning, what, what, uh, how, what's your reaction? What's your response to hearing music, faith, and the double pandemic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, John, it's wonderful to be with you. And thank you so much uh, to Edward and the team at the Center for Christianity and Scholarship for the invitation. Uh, kind of the great joy and a tremendous blessing to be with all of you who are uh, uh, chiming in here via Zoom or phone. Uh, music, uh, well, faith, music, and the double pandemic. You know, faith is one of these words that we understand but have a difficult time articulating. Um, and so for those of us in the Christian um, formation, um, we, we understand faith is to, to have a belief in a higher being we call God um, and to believe in the, the gift of uh, salvation through uh, the embodiment of Jesus Christ who came and uh, became the perfect lamb, uh, sacrificed himself so that we may be free of sin and, and to believe in the promises. So our faith is that God is real. Our, our faith is that there is a structure um, and a an, an apparatus around us so that we're not just drifting uh, through this world by ourselves. And then music is a gift. Uh, so music is a tremendous gift. Uh, uh, myself, I uh, proclaim it to be a divine gift. Um, and, and so uh, it has the, the ability to do what we as human beings decide um, that it can or cannot do. Um, and in many ways, when we give ourselves over to the music, the music tends to take us in places and spaces that we as human beings may not be able to get there ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so faith uh, gives us grounding that we are part of a bigger macro narrative than our eyes, our human eyes can see. Music gives us a language, a lingua franca, as it were, uh, to be able to communicate and express ourselves with one another, with God, um, and just in terms of just expression in general. And then this notion of a double pandemic. You know, we have, you know, uh, COVID-19, uh, the SARS virus, which is wreaking havoc, uh, whether we know it as coronavirus or Rona. Um, you know, we have uh, a huge population of, of beloved individuals who are no longer on the planet. I think we're above 217, 18,000 people here in the United States. Um, the number of infections and cases are going up. So death is around us. Fear and anxiety is around us. Stress is around us. But then there's also this, un, um, this, this, this notion of racial unrest or injustice that has been going on from the beginning of this nation. But it seems like in this moment, People are having to decide whether to open their eyes and see what has always been here or not. And so as people are opening their eyes to see or choosing not to open their eyes to see, it's wreaking another viral epidemic um, or pandemic around the world, such that you watch uh, soccer over in Germany or in France or in the UK and on the back of their jerseys, it says Black Lives Matter. It's not just a United States problem, it's a global problem in terms of racism and the, and the, 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 uh, the havoc of white supremacist ideologies and ideologues. So all of that in together is, is like, as you mentioned, whoa, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, as, as we get to know you and as I, I, I ask some questions that will serve as the basis for introducing you uh, and some of your thoughts uh, to our, our audience, uh, let's go back to the first one. You mentioned faith, and I'm curious for, for where your perspective is. Uh, I, I'll, I'll probe this with some of my own personal journey. Mm -hmm. So we talk about faith and um what it means, but I wonder how you reconcile these words when it comes to faith, uh, spirituality, mm -hmm. and religion. Yeah. So uh, I guess the, be the better question is using those three words, who are you in those spaces? Where are you thinking about the intersection among these three words? Yeah. 
Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. For me, it starts with spirituality. Mm. So spirituality is my unique relationship with my creator, uh, divine, who I will use the terminology God um, to, to, you know, um, to make that connection. So spirituality is that unique, you know, nuanced relationship. Uh, religion is how we systematize that so that I can come and someone else can come and we can find commonality and similarity in our nomenclature and how we articulate that. And that becomes the basis of religion. And then how we normalize that religions in our day-to-day -day life becomes how we kind of articulate our faith. So three different words, three enti different entities um, that are extricably connected, but extremely different, right? So, so um, a lot of folks have religion with no spirituality. A lot of folks would suggest that they're very spiritual without religion. And there are people with faith with neither of the two. And I think that that's a wonderful challenge for us as human beings, right? I believe that Jesus Christ came to the earth to teach us two very important lessons. One, how to be human, and the second, how to be humane. And if we measure ourselves by current uh, uh, existence in terms of society, I think we fell in at both. Mm. All right. Well, that, that that's a good, so I, I wanted to frame how you think about those things. And I, uh, I want to ask one more follow-up question about that whole thing, then we'll move on a little bit. Where are you finding uh, more peace now? And uh, is there a place uh, using one of these three words or perhaps another uh, that has given you a particular sense of peace when we talk about dealing with the uh, multiple challenges that we face in life now? Mm -hmm. I, I think for me, it, it goes back to spirituality is the framework for me It's the foundation It's the scaffolding for which everything else is built. And so for me, when I look at John 3, 16 and 17, they go together for God so loved the world. He, he God so loved the entire world, not just the Christian world and not just the, the believers in the United States. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 goes he did not send him into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. So I believe in a loving God who, who is about saving the world, giving people free will choice. And then a God who has promised going all the way from the beginning of the Bible, all the way through the end, that I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus came in the embodiment of God and said, I will be with you until the end of the age. And, you know, uh, at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit said, I will be with you even now. And so for me, my theological framework, the scaffolding again, my spirituality is that I have a relationship with a God who created everything ex nihilo, right, out of nothing and can do all things but fail. And in that is where I place my trust and in my faith. So sometimes religion lets me down uh -huh. because when I look at something, you know, the, the, the great mystic Howard Thurman moved away from using the terminology Christianity to using the religion of Jesus. Because mm. we as human beings were doing some awful things in the name of Christianity that did not represent what Christian, what, what Jesus Christ was doing. Uh -huh. And so for me, I think that sense of spirituality is where for me, I ground myself um, so that I, have a, have, I don't blow uh, with the wind as the proverbs and many songs talk about <laughs> okay and that's a great segue because i wonder now a part of that grounding so that you don't blow with the wind uh i I'm, i'll bet that there are many roots to this tree oh, i yeah. bet there are many many places that it digs deep and in different areas but let's let, let's go to the music because uh that is our our charge for the evening so where does music fit in that equation for you yeah, you know, I'm, you know, you call yourself a, a country boy. I'm, 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 I'm what I call a city fired country boy. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm originally from Los Angeles, um, but mom is from the backwoods of Alabama, um, a place that's actually not on most maps called Allen, which is in Clark County. Um, the, the county seat is in Grove Hill, Alabama, which is on the map. And so my mother would usually tell people she's from Grove Hill, even though she's from Allen. All and right. down Allen is still the the um, the orange clay dirt. If we went down to to where the house, the family house is, even now, there's no cement around. It's just the country clay dirt. And my dad's from New Orleans. Okay. And so um, the New Orleans, both both sides of my family 
were very musical. My grandfather lived uh, well into his 90s and was an old barrel house pianist. And every time I would go back home, uh, you know, and I, I studied classical music from an early age. And so he would take me as he was going to clean the church on Saturdays in preparation for Sunday morning service. He'd have me sit at the piano and practice my lesson, as he would call it. And then once he finished cleaning the church, he said, now get up and watch me play my lesson. And, you know, he, he would play his barrel house stuff. And so uh, my dad, you know, came from a long line. And so even in our family, uh, the great R&B uh, singer Lloyd Price is a is a cousin of ours. Um, oh, all right. Stagger Lee and, you know, good God in this Claude, you know, um, so he was there with little Richard and all, all those folks during that day. So so I grew up in a musical household with with turn with a turntable and a whole collection of albums that went across the various genres. Um, I started playing at four piano classical and then at 11 um, you kind of had a little of epiphany because everybody was outside playing. I didn't want to play anymore. So so you know I told told my mom I, I wouldn't dare tell my dad but I told my mom I quit <laughs> and uh, she told she took me to the old Sam Goody's record store if you remember. And oh, yeah. remember the old Sam Goody record store at the back, they played, they held sheet music. Mm -hmm. And she she allowed me to buy whatever sheet music I wanted to buy. She was trying to coax me back into the piano. So, you know, being a knucklehead that I was, I bought the most expensive and thickest book there, which was a blue, complete um, uh, song sheet of Stevie Wonder tunes. <laughs> <laughs> and that 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 book sat on the piano for two and a half days until my own curiosity went through and I learned the book because I had already heard the albums. And how old were you then? I was 11. 11 then. OK, I was 11. And so at that point, you know, I, we we I went to church and um, asked the minister of music if I could start playing for the church. And and from then on, it's been it's been a part of, I would say, not just my DNA, but as a part of my being, it's a part mm -hmm. of my balance when I'm not operating in the musical space, even if it's writing, analyzing, if it's just listening, if it's, you know, teaching, I'm out of balance. My, my, my fung and my shui are off. Mm -hmm. And so, so music is a, it, it's, it's a, it's a part of the very fabric of who I am. So I'm, I'm curious now, you, your full title is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm professor of uh, worship, church, and culture, and then the founding executive director for the Institute of the Study of Black Christian Experience. Okay, and you refer to yourself as the, your your titles, do you say the Reverend Doctor? Do you? Yeah, it, 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 de it depends on where I am and who I'm with. You know, most often I don't actually refer to myself as anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, well, all right, well, I, I'm getting to something with that. So, because I, I want to hear how, those came to be, yeah, uh, yeah. Reverend and Doctor. Those yeah. both apply, yeah. In some circles, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, how, it, how do you? I'm so. Let me ask. So, I, I want to find out how how those came to be. Uh, a lot of people talk about being called. A lot of people are led. Uh, how do we get to you, uh, Reverend Doctor, Doctor Reverend, mm -hmm. uh, and and how do you come to be uh, a scholar of? Uh, I'll loosely say religion for now and into worship study. Divine disruptions, man. Absolute mm -hmm. divine disruptions. I went to college. I went to the University of California, Berkeley as a math major. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. and here, I mean, here's the story. Um, I would go to the music department, Morrison Hall at, uh, at Cal Berkeley to practice piano. And I saw this debonair, suave black guy who I didn't even know what he was at the time because I was young, I was 17 years old. I graduated high school at 17. I was up there, finally got out of the house, finally got out of LA. I was just happy. <laughs> and I would go to the music department and this brother would slide from, he didn't even walk, he slid, he glid from one side of the hallway to the other side of the hallway. And I had never seen that before. <laughs> and so I would time when I went to the music building to practice piano, which was downstairs in the basement, so that I can see him just move from one, he always he was always suited down. He was always mm -hmm. just the cleanest brother you ever seen. Mm -hmm. And for many months, he was the only black professor I had seen when I finally was a professor. And then I realized he was not just a professor, he was the chair of the music department. Mm -hmm. 
So one day, man, I got the courage and I walked up to him and this took mad courage. I got the courage to walk up to him. And I basically, in my, you know, untrained, ungroomed, unpolished LA homeboy, probably had my hat turned backwards. I said, man, who are you? And so he smirked in the smirk that he did. And he said, uh, well, who are you? Who are you? Uh, and I told him who I was. And, and this exchange changed my life forever. Mm. This person is none other than uh, Dr. Ali Woodrow Wilson Jr., mm -hmm. um, who, who was my mentor, um, who basically, in, in this exchange, he brought me into the music department. He brought me into his office. And I shared with him, you know, who I was and what I was trying to do with my life. And he gave me a standing appointment once a week for my full four years at, at Cal. Wow. And so, you know, I'm, I'm one of the, one of the, 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 you know, the Wilsonites as we call them. I know my <laughs> big brother, uh, Aunt Kelly is on here. Professor Anthony Kelly is on here. My big brother, uh, we, we, we were in the trenches together at, 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 at Cal. Um, but, but he, Ollie Wilson showed me, Professor Wilson showed me that I could study music as an intellect, as a musician, as a cultural creator, as a, um, a sociologist, and as an anthropologist, we call that ethnomusicology. Mm -hmm. But he showed me, I never knew that. I thought all you did was play music. Mm. He, he showed it to me as a composer, as just a phenomenal uh, scholar. And, you know, when I saw that, I double majored. I wanted to be just like him. Mm. And so I ended up going to graduate school at University of Pittsburgh, where I studied with the great Nathan Davis. Oh, yeah. and, and so I got my music degrees. And, and check this out. Uh, Dr. Wilson uh, went to Washington University in St. Louis. Um, when I finished my doctorate at Pitt, I did two postdoctoral fellowships. I went first to work with David Baker, oh, yeah. uh, who was still at Indiana Bloomington at the time and Portia Marks being all the folks there. And then I went to Washington University, my professor's alma mater, and I, and I worked there. And then I went to a Northeastern University where I was a professor of music for 15 years. Mm. And, and part of that was chair of African-American studies. I ended up going to seminary while I was a professor because a pastor who I was serving under acknowledged that I had a call him in. He had me preach for Black History Month one day as a lay person. Mm. And he said, no, man, you're going to seminary. And he put me in his car and drove me to the seminary and paid for my first course. Wow. And I'm a professor. So all, <laughs> dis all divine disruption. Man, my plan was to go back to LA and be a high school math teacher. And so when I finally finished seminary at, after eight and a half years, the seminary turned around and made me an offer. So I'm actually teaching <laughs> at my alma mater <laughs> and none of it was planned. Why do you do it? <laughs> so, you know, and I told, I told, and here, here's, here's the thing for everybody watching. Be careful what you tell the divine. Be careful what you tell your creator. Be careful what you tell God. I told God three things. And the first thing was that after I got my PhD, I was never going back to school again. I was done. Mm -hmm. Second thing, I told God, I said, I would never be one of these musicians who thought he can get up in the pulpit and preach. My, my, my gift is music. I need to stay in my lane. And the third thing I told God is that I'll never be one of these, and I called it myself, rogue pastors to leave the mainline church and plant a, a ministry. Mm. And, and God choked me on all three of those words. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have similar relationships because there have been things that I, I have also said in uh, my word for it is God just says, oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. don't do that. Huh? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so uh, clearly you are a man of strong faith and foundation. And, um, uh, again, our connecting point for this first conversation, and we, I think we can have a series of 100 conversations, to be honest with you. Uh, but the first one is, is founded in music. So let, let me uh, be a little bit specific with this next question and line of conversation about where music fits for you right now as we are dealing with multiple pandemics. Yeah, yeah. So I think 
even though I'm a scholar, even though I'm an educator, um, you know, even though I'm a pastor, even though I'm a theologian and a public theologian, I'm on, you know, NPR, I was on NPR this morning. I think as a musician and musicians have a sensitivity that as long as you know the lingua franca, we'll have a conversation with you regardless of where you come from the world, regardless of what your nationality is, regardless of what your gender is, regardless of what your training is, as long as you can speak this language and show music the respect that it is due, right? Then, then, then there's an engagement and there's actually a desire to engage. So musicians are probably, in my opinion, some of the most sensitive people on the planet, some of the most humanitarian people in the planet, some of the most respectful people on the planet because we desire to literally engage in conversation with as many people as we can, as often as we can, wherever we can. Now, let me probe that. When you say show the music respect, what, what, what does that actually look like? So, you know, one of the things about music is that music has its own narrative. And the folks who have created music before us have fed into or planted seeds uh, uh, and, and those are the seeds that we have blossomed into or around. So for instance, if I said to you that Duke Ellington uh, is one of my you know, favorites or whatnot, and yet I don't know Duke Ellington repertoire, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not having good integrity there. I'm, I'm not necessarily uh -huh. being true to the music because if I don't understand what Duke Ellington was doing or better yet, let me say, take John Coltrane, right? So, so, so if, if I say that I'm a part of that legacy, but I don't know the legacy, then, you know, I, you know, and I think that that happens with how we listen to music and how we choose to hear. I remember, um, just to give one example, you know, uh, you remember this lyric, don't push me, cause, cause I'm, I'm close, close to, to the edge. edge. Mm -hmm. I'm trying, yeah, not, to lose my head. And then you get the nervous uh, laughter, uh, right? Uh, 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 Sometimes uh, uh, I wonder how I keep from going under. Mm -hmm. And when people listen to that, if all they hear is a party jam, then they haven't really heard what was being expressed. What was being expressed is a young black man who's expressing that he's about to lose his mind mm -hmm. because of all the societal stuff that's going on around him. And he's saying, sometimes I wonder how I keep from going under. And if the church, if society had responded to that young black man as somebody worthy of intervention or intercession, mm -hmm. then I'm not sure that we would have all the stuff that we had that came after that. Right. But when you have folks who are crying out, asking for help, and all you want to do is party and groove over that, I mean, what does that say to the person? Right. And I think that that's, that's the challenge done. that we have. Yeah. Right. So let me, so when it comes to that too, let's just say, uh, I'm going to come from another perspective. What if there is a person who is watching TV and seeing all the things that are happening with uh, racial disunity in particular? Uh, of course, the dual, the, one of the two parts of the dual pandemic. Uh, what if they want to go to music to find some solace? What if they want to go to um, something that, that you know, say, say somebody comes to you and says, you know, I just really want to have something to hold on, on to, and you want to anchor them in, in, a, in a, perhaps a piece of music or a body of work. Uh, is there a place you might point somebody? Well, you know, anybody who knows me, you know, I'm going to John Coltrane first, man. I'm, I'm taking Love Supreme. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm right okay. there, right? I mean, what a beautiful four part suite, you know, starts with this notion of acknowledgement, right? Yeah. And then <laughs> resolution and then pursuance and then a psalm. I mean, it don't get no more liturgical <laughs> than, you know, <laughs> I mean, for real, I'm, I'm taking people to 1964, yeah. John Coltrane, who was steeped in speaking truth to power um, you know, his wife at the time even made the, the comment that nine, over 90% of the music that he was playing was prayer, mm. right? And, mm. and so for me, for people looking for solace, sometimes the words get in the way, sometimes, not all the time, mm -hmm. but sometimes the words get in the way. And so I want you to hear, hear the sonic words 
that Coltrane is playing so that you can experience the embodiment of that sound. Mm -hmm. And then we can take you to some words. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I've, I've often heard the quote that uh, someone says, God has given us music so that we can pray without words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Now, uh, there, there are a couple of connected points here. Like I said, we, we could talk all night. Uh, so let me let me get us focused. I want to ask one of the questions that was submitted, but it also ties back to this line of conversation. So one person has asked, uh, how have secular music and Christian music influenced one another historically yeah. uh, and currently? Yeah, yeah. So one of the challenges of binary thinking is that it it assumes that there are hard edges and hard lines and hard boundaries. And, and so, you know, if I suggest to you um, and, and, and our listeners can go and, 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 and vet this and do the fact checking, uh, whether they want to believe it or not. But if I suggest to you some of the greatest hymns of all time were text that were set to old drinking songs, mm. which is the merger of sacred texts and secular tune, people would suggest that I'm being blasphemous, right? So, so if I suggest to you, and I'm only making a suggestion, y'all can go validate it and vet it when you want to. <laughs> if I suggest to you that a hymn that many of us know, not, not the amazing grace that John Newton wrote, but the other amazing grace, amazing grace, how sweet this, right? That was set to the tune of Oh Danny Boy, right? Oh Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipes, are, right? Then people are like, oh my God, no, no, right? But if I say that Amazing Grace, right? I once was blind, but now I'm fine. The, that one was set too, right? Mm -hmm. And we can go down the hymn. That's why when you get a hymnal mm -hmm. and you go to the bottom of the hymnal, you'll see you know, the strophic patterns, right? And then you'll see tune. Mm -hmm. And then it'll tell you too. So, so even the early hymnists were writing uh, text and wanted to be memorable so they could be taught very quickly. So they knew that the people who were sitting in the pews were just chilling on Saturday night, right? And and they knew those old songs. So so that merger goes all the way back. And I, I, I think it's more amorphous than we realize. Okay, so I want to probe that for a second. I've got a, a song I want to play uh, for reference. And then another one right after that. So I want to go with uh, with the first song now. Oh, there's a man going around. So uh, what's your reaction to that, first of all? <laughs> two, let me give you two. All right. The first reaction is I grew up listening to, you know, this type of style of, you know, quartet singer. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But my second reaction is I got a woman right over there. Um, right. You know, Ray Charles. Okay. So let, let's just play a snippet of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got a woman way over town that's good to me. Oh, yeah. Say, I got a woman way over town. Good to me. Oh, yeah. She give me money when I'm in need. Yeah, she's a kind of. So, so you knew where I was going. So now let me let me tell you where, where I'm going to, to to put this word back in there in our conversation to see what your thoughts are about it. Respect. Yeah. So I asked earlier about how do we respect the music, and you you have an answer. So I wonder where you reconcile the word respect with 
what Ray Charles did with yeah. this song. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ray Charles had a message that he was trying to get out the same way that Kanye West had a message that he was trying to get out. You know, when he takes that roof, you know, she gives me money. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and he uses that. I think the challenge that we have here is that intention. Mm. It's, it's, it's what is the intention of the artist? And I tend to be one who is not necessarily prone for censorship. And so um, I'm I'm more inclined to be able to ask Ray Charles, why did you do that? Right, knowing that Ray and I didn't I didn't I didn't know Ray Charles, but I knew a lot of musicians who played with him. Ray Charles was a brilliant creative, and he rarely did anything without meaning and without intention. You mm -hmm. know, including the way that he sang things really slow mm -hmm. to really make you feel every subdivision of that beat, right? Everything was, and so I think for me, it's about intention. Now I can I can be the critic and judge and say, you shouldn't do that because you know, that was secular, that was sacred and you you took it. But my thing is intent. There's, there's mm -hmm. meaning behind the meaning. So let me let me follow up on that. One of the person, one of the questions I got is specifically: music is made across humanity. Mm -hmm. Can it not uh, just be universal, but unifying? So, go ahead. The, yeah, I mean, this is, the this is an interesting challenge, right? Because I think many people believe that music is universal. It's a universal language. Mm -hmm. I don't hear it as a universal language. I see its presence universal. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that we've de developed the ears to hear it universally. And I think that that's a challenge. Um, so, so I believe that music has a capacity uh, to be a healing agent, to be a unifier. But we have a responsibility as human beings who are the listeners to actually receive message and, and have enough integrity to do the work. Uh -huh. Like, you know, most of us only want stuff that we can do, grab bits and pieces of, and it's easy, right? But when we get to stuff that is more complicated that we don't understand, we tend not to ask those questions. We tend not to probe those things. We tend not to wrestle with those concepts. And I think that in that sense is where music becomes this difficult thing where mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily do what I, I believe it has the possibility to do. Okay, now to, to continue on the thread that you said some of a bit earlier, uh, kind of related to this, the juxtaposition of the sacred and the secular, I'm gonna play uh, another song now. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we're not prepared for adversity. When it happens, sometimes we're caught short. We don't know exactly how to handle it when it comes up. Sometimes we don't know just what to do when adversity takes over. <laughs> and uh, I have advice for all of us. I got it from our pianist, Joe Zabinu, who wrote this tune. And it sounds like what you're supposed to say when you have that kind of problem. It's called mercy, mercy, mercy. There's a a juxtaposition of the sacred and the secular. I mean, I, I've used it. I mean, we we know, by the way, for uh, anyone who ha happens not to know that, uh, Cannonball Adderley, Mercy, 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 written by Joe Zawinul. Uh So this is a jazz performance, mm -hmm. live jazz performance, mm -hmm. uh, but it sounds like church. Yeah, yeah, on purpose. On purpose. Yeah. So, so uh, how, where does that land for you? Yeah, I mean, Cannonball Adderley knew who he was talking to, though. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if I'm not mistaken, it was a live recording. Uh, if I know the record, I think it was actually part of, um, well, let me not say that. So he, he knew who he was talking to, 
And the fact is that music has always played a number of different roles in different cultural contexts. Mm -hmm. In black spaces, music has always played a role where when we didn't have economic development, when we didn't have political agency, when we didn't have social mobility, we always had music. And, mm -hmm. and the music allowed us to express our desires, uh, deal with our challenges, um, talk about you know the things that made us frustrated. But in black music, there's always a ray of hope. Mm. It always resolves to the sense of hope. And it's grounded in this notion that things may not be working out right now, but if you keep on holding on, right? If you, if you, if you just keep your feet under you and keep standing, then things will resolve themselves in due time. And so this sense and sensibility is, is within all of the genres of, of, of African-American creative expression. And that's the challenge that we have with the genre itself mm -hmm. because they're, they all come from the same river. They just tend to be different tributaries of, right. of, of different expression, right? Right. So music living through the pandemic. I mean, you just hit on something right there that yeah. uh, uh, is a guiding light to get us through. It is a guiding light to get us through. No question about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you, where, where are people who wrestle with this juxtaposition of the sacred and the secular? I mean, let, let's just say, for example, that we uh, play this for a colleague and uh, arguably what we just heard in Mercy, Mercy, Mercy uh, perhaps touches on something that moves us in a spiritual way. Mm -hmm. uh, is God in that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I leave room the same way that I believe that 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 God leaves room for people to make decisions. Mm. Right. So so for me, uh, as a pastor, uh, and I tell people all the time, the greatest joy I have is actually having non-believers as part of our congregation. Mm. Because if we didn't, we wouldn't be doing our work. It'd just mm. be a social club. Yeah. Right. So so for me. I want people to have the room and the space to make their decisions. I, I believe that that's actually what the Bible teaches us from the Old Testament to the, to the end of the New Testament. The Old Testament, God created the entire world, you know, put Adam and Eve on there. They screwed up. You know, now humanity is cursed. And then you see a whole lineage of God tell people to do this. The people do this instead. God said, do this people do this instead, mm -hmm. right? And so we have the, the result of that. And then God desires to send Jesus to, to teach us in my you know, uh, articulation, how to be human, how to be humane. And then we still see Jesus teaches us to do this. And in his name, we do yeah. this, right? Jesus yeah. says, do this. And in his name, we do this. So, so, but the point is, there's always a sense of hope that God, I believe, gives us an opportunity to seek forgiveness and to get it right. Mm -hmm. So every morning that we wake up, and this, I mean, again, this is the narration of a whole lot of songs. Every morning when we wake up, we get another chance to try it all over again. And I believe that that's the hope that mm -hmm. we should lean into, regardless if your nomenclature is God, regardless if your nomenclature is some, some other entity, or for some people, no entity. I want people to have a choice. And I think that that's the beautiful thing that music gives you an opportunity to have a choice. What do you hear? What are you sensing? What are you feeling? What are you processing? What does it invoke for you? What are you reflecting on? Music gives you a choice. Mm. You know, what you said reminds me of uh, how I often talk about the blues with people and how I think about the blues with people. Uh, the, the bottom line of that, uh, wherever you start to, to dissect it, uh, some might argue that the jazz inspired blues is uh, rooted in a sense of having joy inside my pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joy despite my pain. Yeah. Uh, music and joy in music despite the pandemic. Yeah. Despite the, and, and name your pandemic, whether that's the virus or racism, uh, the division in our country, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm hearing you right, you're, you are supporting the notion that we can find spirituality in, in music, period. For instance, John Coltrane's 
I mean, one of the name the name of one of those movements is spiritual. Yeah. So how even you know I mean right right there I mean that that that's 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 what we call our prima facie case right there. Yeah. Uh, it's called spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a foundational question that we as human beings have. You know, and, and the what am I doing here? How did I get here? <laughs> what am I responsible for? You know, what 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 is you know, you know what how am I going to be measured in terms of my productivity while I'm here? Right. And, and that, that chimes us into a higher something or a bigger something or a why, you know, however you want to articulate it, but it takes us in a different direction beyond ourselves. Beyond ourselves. Yeah. All right. All right. Now I'm going to move on because uh, the time is flying by. I want to make <laughs> sure I get a, a, a few more questions that were submitted in. Now, now this is an interesting one. Uh, should churches strive for one musical style or should they include multiple styles? What is gained and lost in each strategy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The ecclesiology question. So, <laughs> so let, let me back up. A lot of churches articulate that they're multicultural when they're at, actually multi-ethnic. Churches have a culture. There's a defined culture in the space. Mm -hmm. And so until we acknowledge that, we're kind of grabbing at shoestrings. So when the culture is defined, part of the culture is the, is the palate, right? The taste palate, right? In terms of what the aesthetic palate, you know, is acceptable and not acceptable there. So I, I grew up at a, at, a, at a black, what we call a silver stocking Baptist church in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Silver stocking is a code word which meant that it was a middle-class, well-to-do Black Baptist church. Silver stockings, uh, for those who don't know, back in the probably 40s and 50s were more expensive than flesh tone stockings. So if you were a Black woman and you could afford to wear silver stockings, particularly on Sunday, you had a little extra check, you know, change, right? So, so it was known. And so in a silver stocking church, we actually have a budget for the music ministry. So I grew up, um, hearing traditional gospel, hearing anthems, hearing hymns, hearing Handel Messiah at you know Christmas time done very well with with with, with you know musicians brought in to to supplement our staff, um, as well as contemporary gospel, but that was a part of the palette of the church. So some churches have to define what their repertoire is. Do they have the capacity to build out that repertoire? Um, or if they're just going to do one style, uh, and again, it is based on the culture of the church, but every church has a culture. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Now I, I want to keep it moving because we've got a couple specific questions that I want to be sure I get. Uh, let me just read this one as it was presented mm -hmm. right now. Some of us lament the loss of worshiping together in person in church. Mm -hmm. Some lament the loss of live concerts, whether secular or religious. Mm -hmm. What does the human desire to listen to music together tell us about ourselves? Yeah, it tells us that we are relational beings and we need each other. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 the message there should actually help us to need each other beyond the entertainment vein to actually need each other to survive, mm. right? So, so when, when, when parishioners are challenging, how come we're not meeting? Because we've been virtual since March. I said, because your specific life matters more to me than the tradition of quote unquote going to church. Mm. I want you to live. And so in doing that, we had to make a very difficult decision. So the fact that you desire that is something to be embraced and to, to, to honor, right? I mean, I, I think the challenge is that in this nation, we have been such a self-gratifying nation that I want what I want and I want it right now, but but to 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 wait for something that actually means something for you is not a bad thing. Mm. And besides, we got social media and there's some phenomenal musicians doing live concerts from the Blue Note and from different churches and, and all kind of stuff. So so find your live music. It's out there. You may not be able to experience it the way that you're used to, but but musicians still need to eat and still need to live. So support us however you can, please. And thank you. Well, that, that's going to be wonderful on the other side of this. I, I, uh, where I sit as vice provost for the arts, I, I talk about how we're planning and uh, in our lane at Duke, of course, but 
across the globe, people are planning. And uh, my suspicion is that, uh, well, it's not much more than a suspicion. I know it. We <laughs> are sequestered and we are in spaces where we are moved to create. Yes. Uh, it is often said that where there's no suffering, there's no art. And we are suffering through oh, pandemics, mm -hmm. through, I mean, you know, name, name your lane. Mm -hmm. So by the time we are freed to roam about the cabin again, uh, I, I proffer that you ain't going to be able to get a ticket to nothing. I agree. Everybody's going to be packing the houses where there's an exhibit, there's a gallery, exhibit, there's a concert. Uh, you best be there. And I, I say my admonition to people now is to remember that uh, artists were here for you during this period. Uh, I wrote a little piece about that, but I, 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 I want to say now to, to, to that point, uh, since artists are here for, uh, for us during this period, as you think about where you have wrestled with the pandemics, um, can you speak a little bit to your specific motivation, your specific uh, relationship with music now? Yeah. Maybe be a Are you writing? Are you listening to specific songs? Or you mentioned uh, Love Supreme, but are you? Where are you in that space? What's what's what specific things that maybe somebody can write down and say, I want to listen to that too, or listen to something you wrote? What's getting you through? Yeah, yeah, John, I I, I appreciate this question because I was telling a colleague the other day that once here in Massachusetts, the the stay at home order kind of happened on March fourteenth. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll never forget that because I was actually headed. Uh, to Charlotte um, to, to do some teaching um, and everything got cut off. And the only thing that I knew to turn to, and I'll be very honest, I, I couldn't even pray in that moment, man. It was just, it, the, the, it was so heavy. I couldn't even pray in that moment because it seemed like, you know, the, the Breonna Taylor situation happened in February and, and now we're in March and people were just starting to find out about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then things just hit like this. Then you got this pandemic and folks are saying it was a hoax and folks are saying that, you know, we don't need to, you know, and then you're seeing the death numbers go up and the cases number goes up. And then we hit May 25th and, 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 and the murder of George Perry Floyd Jr. by the knee of officer, you know, Minneapolis officer Derek Chauvin. And I'm like, man, it was just hard to just find a place to just sit. So what I did I challenged myself to sit at the piano for at least an hour every day. Mm. And I hadn't done that since I don't know when. Mm -hmm. And I mean, every day went through scales, went through sight reading, just, I needed to get back zoned in. And, and that time on the piano became my prayer time. Mm -hmm. And it tapped me back in because again, music is a part of me. And that, that, that's my heart language as it were. And, and then I was able to, start listening to stuff because I couldn't even listen to anything anymore because I, I was like no you sound too angry or I'm too angry you ain't angry enough you yeah. know or I'm hurt and you don't sound hurt you know so then you know I went back and I you know got a little Kendrick Lamar you know talked about everything's gonna be all right we gonna be all right you know I got you know um little Kirk Franklin you know smile you know um had to go back in my um my Patti LaBelle, you know, mm. whole archive, you know, somewhere over the rainbow. I need, I needed to just imagine her kicking her shoe off when she was singing that. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, <laughs> I, I just went back to the old pies. Right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I went across the genres, man, just trying to pick selections that have meaning to me. What, whether it was in the text. Or whether it was in the the melodic structure of the song, um, you know. But I, yeah, I don't I don't have a a, a one size fits all equation, and mm -hmm. I certainly don't have a playbook. You mm -hmm. know, but well, that's you know, that's the wonderful thing about the the resources that we have uh, been given. God has inspired so many of us to be in so many different places at so many different times, and there's an overlap here and overlap there. Uh, something you said reminds me of a song that I, it's one of my go-tos, James Cleveland, What Shall I Do? What shall and I do? he said, uh, you know, when he, he he loves to talk through them, as we all know, and uh, there's a line where he said something about having to go to the hospital, and he said, uh, when you said you didn't know to pray, he said, I was hurting, hurting so bad, I didn't know to pray. Mm -hmm. And that 
uh, as I say, that's a that's a go to for me because that's when you know that you're really getting at the raw emotion. That's when you know when you are in a place where God has allowed you to get, which is one thing I want to get to. Has allowed you to get. So some argue that you might draw closer to Him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I you know I definitely for me, mm. and 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 definitely for me in this season. Be, because for me, I you know, I grew up in, in Los Angeles. I remember 1991, two very uh, uh, horrible situations happened. You had the Rodney King beating, and then you had the murder of Latasha Harlan, who was a young African-American girl who was who was murdered by a Korean grocer. And, and I remember those two situations like they were yesterday. And I remember the angst that I had and the anger as a young man uh, wishing that the 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 people in power would do something. Yeah, I, I wish that the police would have done something other than beat Rodney King up. I wish that 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 the jurisprudence system would have done something uh, to bring um, you know justice for the murder of this young sister. And 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 when I see my children, I have two sons, uh, seventeen and fifteen. Mm. And when I saw my children ride through this summer, with everything going on, I saw in them what I experienced back then. Mm -hmm. And that broke my heart because as a parent, you know, we try to protect our children and create a space where they'll have a better existence than we, than we have. And I'm watching this replay itself. Mm -hmm. and, and the second time around is worse than experiencing the first time around. Mm -hmm. And so, so for me, I pray that no matter what we are listening to, that it brings us together, that it unifies us as human beings, not as political platforms, not as Autobots or Decepticons, but as human beings mm. who, who breathe the same air, who live off of the same land, who, who, who are co-inhabitants of God's precious space that he has given us dominion over. I pray that whatever we're listening to feeds that type of sensibility and sensitivity to us so that we don't have to replay history again. Right. Oh, that's powerful. You know, I, I want to, there's a, a question that's come in, but I want to follow that just for a second. What I want, I want to think about unity and think about how we get back uh, as a pastor, as a musician, uh, as a human being, yeah. uh, how, how do we get back to a state of unity? Yeah, I think there are two principles here. First, that unity does not mean uniformity. Mm. So the whole notion of assimilating into something so that we all agree and think the same way, I think that's a facade. Mm. I think the second thing is that the Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. Mm. And so we need to have a vision for what unity looks like before we pursue it. People mm. talk about reconciliation all the time, but people don't, don't realize that reconciliation was a ministry that was endowed to the church. So we as spiritual leaders have a responsibility for reconciliation. And if the church doesn't step up and, 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 and magnify the vision for what unity looks like, then, then, then we're lost and too many people are dying. For me, 217 plus, 218 plus thousand people is too many people. So the church has to step up and not just the white church, the black church, the Asian church, the Latinx church, the multicultural church and the second gen church, the third gen church, but the Church of Jesus Christ of the United States of America, we need to figure out how to get together so that we can show forth a vision for what unity looks like, where we are the people, where we believe that we are created equally in the face of God, where we all have access to the pursuit of justice, liberty for all, where, where we all right are have have the rights as first, you know. Uh, you know, first class citizens and not right. a, a caste structure, you know. Right. So until the church steps up and uh -huh. spotlights that video, I mean that that vision, then you know, too many people are gonna perish. And that grieves my heart. Oh man, just just one wonderful. Like we, we could talk all night, I'm telling you. <laughs> we, we may have to end this call and I'll call I'll call you at least. We can keep talking. 
Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's already 8.03, so I'm, I'm gonna signal to uh, our audience that we have uh, time for a couple more questions. Uh, so we're gonna try to be good stewards of your time here now. This is a question that's come in. I'm gonna uh, read it just as it was written. Uh, let's see. This says, the first two parts of this event title are faith and music. Uh, we can listen to music without faith, and we can perhaps be a people of faith without music. Mm -hmm. What is missing if the two are separated? What is an example of what it looks like when we write God's story of redemption into music? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting paradox. Mm. And it's interesting to me because there's, there's one missing presupposition here that mm. we can listen to music without faith but we forget that the people who create music have faith. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's the intentionality of the message that's being transmitted. So in many ways, we can choose to turn off our ability to receive any kind of faith messaging, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Uh -huh. so, so we forget that, that artists are not just utilitarian folks who need to come up with five tracks every five days in order to get you know, the, the, you know, the check or whatnot. Right. That, that, that we are as artists, I'm speaking as artists now, that we're speaking through our own tension mm. of what does it mean to be of spiritual being, of religious being, or a faith being, combination of the three, the trifecta, or maybe mm. two of the three, or one of the three, or none of the three. But that's oftentimes what you experience in the music. Us actually wrestling, what, it, what does it mean for me to be human in this moment? Like, mm. what, what does it mean for me to actually be on the planet when my mentors and my dear friends are no longer here? Mm. Like, how do I process that? And that that breaks my articulation up into a much bigger picture. So, so yeah, I think there are examples of, of musicians who may be agnostics, um, who, who may be atheists, um, who, who bring in sense and sensibility. But, but sometimes the divine works on that before it gets to you. Mm. And so I, I think there's there's opportunities for all of that to 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 operate, you know, in a sense. Oh man, uh, just just powerful. I, I, I'm I'm moved by your words and by uh, the gift that God has given you. And uh, like I said, we, we're gonna talk some more. We're gonna talk some more. <laughs> uh, so to to wrap things up, referring back to music, faith, and the double pandemic. Yeah. Music and faith, despite the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, I'm feeling particularly moved to share one thing and then um, ask you to share the same thing. So yeah. just, just a quick story. Uh, my grandmother, who had passed away so many years ago, uh, had uh, pancreatic cancer. Yeah. And um, you know how the doctors will often do. They, they give you the, the timeline that they think uh, when a transition might occur. Mm -hmm. And it was Christmas morning of that year. And uh, in the middle of the night, uh, uh, we were all startled awake by my grandfather yelling and uh, trying to get everybody's attention because he couldn't wake her up. Mm -hmm. So we called uh, the paramedics and um, she actually did wake up by the time they had gotten there. And uh, of course we went to the hospital and I remember my mother and my aunt piling in the car because I was gonna be driving right behind that ambulance mm -hmm. to see about my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that I guess when I got out, had gotten out of the car early in the day, earlier in the day, um, I was listening to this particular song and I, I, I must've been listening to it loud because when I cranked the car up, it started loud, but it started at the beginning. It was Marvin Winans and Perfected Praise version of Jesus Saves. Now, several months, actually, it was almost a year later that my grandmother did pass away. But in that moment, with my mother and my aunt in the car, we listened to Jesus Saves. And for all the things that you think might happen in that space, they happened because we got to the hospital. She was uh, awake and talking with us and stayed with us for, again, almost another year. Mm -hmm. So I go to that song now whenever I feel like something is going wrong when I think about the pandemic of uh, the virus, when I think about the pandemic of racism, when I want to be in a different and better space, that's one of my go-to songs. 
So I wonder if, uh, so I'm sharing that with our audience. Y'all need to just go get that whole record. It's, it's hard to find, but go find it. Marvin Winans and uh, Perfected Praise Choir. Uh, so I wonder if as a, a, a parting part of our conversation and the concluding part of our conversation, if you uh, will hand our audience something that they can hold on to yeah. uh, that parallels what I just shared. Yeah, yeah. My, my grandmother, um, uh, we called her Medea, mm. way before Tyler Perry. <laughs> called her Medea, and Medea had a enlarged heart, and um, the way that it manifests um, in in her illnesses was not only diabetes and a number of other things, but she began to have dementia. And this is my mother's mother, and one of the things that she never lost though. She never lost the ability to recite scripture mm. and she never lost the ability to sing hymns. Mm. And so one of the hymns that she always sang until, the, until her last day was Charles Tinley's, We'll Understand It Better By and By. by, and, by. and the chorus of that song goes, by and by, when the morning comes, mm -hmm. all the saints of God are gathered home. We'll tell the story of how we've overcome and will understand it better by and by. That took her on home to glory. That gives me life. Mm. Well, uh, that is so powerful to connect uh, spirituality, music in the pandemic and living through these times. Uh, I, I just say, I thank you for sharing and giving so much of yourself uh, to answer these questions and be with us in this space. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I just want to say thank you. And uh, uh, of course, admonish you to stay strong and continue to, to follow what God would have you do. Amen. Amen. Bless you, my brother. What a, what a joy to be with you and a tremendous gift on this Monday evening. And for all who are with us today, uh, whether live or uh, the recording would it would a joy to be with you as well thank you for the opportunity and now i'll hand it back over to uh brother dixon well thank you emmett thank you john for uh sharing your thoughts and experiences and lives with us tonight and your faiths and your love of music um we deeply appreciate it thank you to the audience for those of you that joined us tonight that are still with us uh, we hope that you benefited from this evening and continue the conversation with friends and family. Finally, we thank you once again to all of the co-sponsoring entities, Duke Initiatives and Theology and the Arts, Duke Crew, RUF, InterVarsity, and Something Borrowed, Something Blue. Good night to you all. Godspeed. <laughs>